And welcome to another edition of the Hank Unplugged podcast. We are, of course, committed to bringing the most interesting, informative, inspirational people directly to you on this podcast. And uh, on today's podcast, I'm not going to bring a guest. I'm going to bring a very interesting, informative, and I suppose correctly understood inspirational subject directly to you. And I want to start with a question on this podcast. It's a question that probably all of you have thought about in one context or another. If you followed my ministry for any period of time, you probably know that I love to play golf. And having played golf for a long period of time and read golf magazines and books, the one thing that is a commonality is that people are looking for that secret sauce, that secret ingredient, that secret move. They want to know what is the secret to Rory McIlroy's swing or Tiger Woods' swing or Jack Nicklaus's swing or Ben Hogan's swing. What is the secret? Well, the secret is they worked hard at it. They dug it out of the dirt, but that's another story. The point is people want shortcuts. Everyone wants to know the secret. You know, the secret to health, the secret to wealth, the secret to having a successful relationship. Of course, the secret to making a fortune on Wall Street and and the big one, the secret to maintaining your perfect weight. I've been looking for that secret for a long time. You know, uh, talking about secrets, I mean, the list can go on and on. It's endless. And thus, when Rhonda Byrne informed the world that she had discovered the secret to life, a secret that has been harnessed by the greatest people in all of history, she named Plato and Shakespeare and Newton, and Hugo, Beethoven, Lincoln, Emerson, Edison, Einstein. Well, when she said that she discovered this secret harnessed by these great people in history, the world took notice. And so within weeks, the secret I'm talking about a book. The secret topped bestseller lists and then morphed into a cultural phenomenon. Oprah dubbed the secret. So Oprah even took note. In fact, she was at the forefront of expanding this secret. But she dubbed the secret life-changing. According to Oprah, the thoughts and the feelings that you put out into the world, both good and bad, are exactly what is always coming back to you. So you have the life that you have created. Says Oprah, I've been talking about this for years on my show now. I just never called it the secret. So what is the secret? Well, the secret, says Rhonda Byrne, is the law of attraction. She says, the greatest teachers who have ever lived have told us that the law of attraction is the most powerful law in all of the universe. And then as she goes on to explain, the law of attraction is the law of creation. Quantum physicists tell us that, that the entire universe emerged from thought. You create your life through your thoughts. And the law of attraction, along with those thoughts, and every single person does the exact same thing. They create their lives through their thoughts, through the law of attraction. 
it doesn't just work if you know about it. It has always been working in your life and every other person's life and that throughout all of history. Thus, the pontification of Rhonda Byrne. Now, while the science of quantum physics is complex, it is allegedly simple to apply. Says Rhonda Byrne, and this is quite a quote, the creative process used in the secret, which was taken from the New Testament in the Bible, is as easy in terms of a guideline for you to create what you want in simple steps. And what are those simple steps? Well, you ask, you believe, and then you receive. So three simple steps, ask, believe, receive. And then she points to herself as a prime example. To transform herself from fat to thin, what did she do? Well, she thought thin thoughts and did not so much as look at, at fat people. Now, <laughs> I got to quote her directly here. Word for word, Rhonda Byrne. If you see people who are overweight, do not observe them, but immediately switch your mind to the picture of you in your perfect body and then feel it. As a result, she says, I now maintain my perfect weight of 116 pounds, and I can eat whatever I want. According to the secret, the error, the mistake, is to think that food is responsible for weight gain. That's the mistake. The most common thought that people hold, says Rhonda Byrne, and I used to hold it too, is that food was responsible for my weight gain. That is a belief that does not serve you. And in my mind now, it is completely balderdash. Food is not responsible for putting on weight. It is your thought that food is responsible for putting on weight that actually has food putting on weight. Remember, thoughts are primary cause of everything, and the rest is effects from those thoughts. Think perfect thoughts, and the result must be perfect weight. Now, do you get that? I mean, this is, this is incredible. I mean, uh, think about this for a second. This is a cultural phenomenon. This is being promoted by no less a cultural heavyweight than Oprah Winfrey. And the thought here is that eating the wrong foods or eating too much food isn't the re result, isn't the cause, I should say, of your gaining weight. The cause of your gaining weight is not eating too much food or eating the wrong foods or eating at the wrong times. The result is your thoughts. The primary cause of everything is those thoughts. So if you think perfect thoughts, and in her case, her perfect thought is, I'm 116 pounds. If you think those perfect thoughts, you can eat whatever you want, and you will maintain the perfect weight. It's hard to believe that the culture would fall for this. But let me tell you, not only the culture has fallen for this, but as I want to point out a little later on in this podcast, the Christian subculture is falling for this as well. At first blush, Rhonda Burns rhetoric might seem merely silly. But if you think about this clearly, there's a clear and present danger in her reasoning. 
because just as her followers must avoid fat people for fear of becoming fat, remember she said explicitly that, so too they must, by extension, avoid cancer victims for fear of contracting cancer, or for that matter, poor people for fear of becoming poor. In other words, you have to avoid the very people that Jesus exhorts us to care for. We shouldn't so much as look at them. Byrne and her contributors, the contributors to her book, are remarkably open with respect to the many dangerous hues of the secret's dark underbelly. In other words, they've thought deep and long about the ramifications of what they're saying. And as such, Rhonda Byrne points out events in history where masses of lives were lost. While some might find it incomprehensible that multitudes could have attracted the same massacre, Rhonda Byrne simply does not. Here's what she says. If people believe, if they believe they can be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they have no control over outside circumstances, those thoughts of fear and separation and powerlessness, if persistent, can attract them to being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Again, thoughts create this reality. Byrne goes on to say, nothing can come into your experience unless you summon it through persistent thoughts. <laughs> you, you, you think it can't get worse, but as contributing authors of The Secret have made absolutely crystal clear, victims of suffering and tragedy have attracted those very circumstances to their lives. So I'll give you an example. When asked whether Jessica Lunsford, who is a nine-year-old Florida girl, whether Jessica was brutally raped and murdered, whether, whether she is brutally raped and murdered because of her thoughts, whether she attracted this horror of rape and murder to herself, a contributor to The Secret endorsed by Oprah Winfrey, a man by the name of Joe Vitale, responded by saying, we are attracting everything to ourselves and there are no exceptions. In short, thoughts are the primary cause of everything of everything, whether good or bad. On one hand, thin thoughts produce thin bodies. On the other hand, six million Jews, according to this paradigm, brought the horrors of the Holocaust upon their own heads. And as the secret makes crystal clear, the law of attraction never, ever, ever slips up. In other words, there are no exclusions to the law of attraction. If something came to you, you drew it with prolonged thought. Says Byrne, you are the master of the universe, and the genie is there to serve you. For Rhonda Byrne, the genie is the law of attraction. But now I want to take this from the cultural context to the Christian context. Because we have a Christian megastar saying much the same thing. And that megastar is Joel Osteen, and for Osteen, it is the word of faith that corresponds to the law of attraction. As such, he is committed deeply committed and has been for decades committed to the notion that faith is a force, that words are the containers of the force, and that through the force of faith, you can create your own reality. Sound familiar? 
He explains this in his mega bestseller, Your Best Life Now. Jeronda Byrne has the secret. He has the mega bestseller, Your Best Life Now. And in that bestseller, he says, you have to begin speaking words of faith over your life. Your words have enormous creative power. The moment you speak something out, you give birth to it. This is a spiritual principle. And it works whether what you are saying is good or bad, positive or negative. So according to Osteen, and by the way, he influences the lives of tens of millions of people in more than 100 nations worldwide, not only through his weekly television broadcast, but through his New York Times best-selling books, his internationally speaking tours, his, uh, his weekly top 10 podcasts. According to Osteen, it is not enough to merely think positively. You need to speak positively about yourself. You need to hear it over and over again. Now, while Osteen and Byrne do have differences, they are united in the belief that the force of faith is so powerful that even God, however you define God, is bound by its irrevocable reality. And in evidence, Osteen cites the birth of John the Baptist. Here's the story, at least the story as told by Joel Osteen. Zachariah doubted that his wife could give birth to a son. Thus God rendered Zachariah speechless during the entirety of Elizabeth's pregnancy. So, says Joel Osteen, why did God take away his speech? It is because God knew that Zechariah's negative words would cancel out his plan. See, God knows the power of our words. He knows we prophesy our future. And he knew Zechariah's own negative words would stop his or God's plan. Osteen is so convinced that words create reality that he has gone so far as to transform an unfortunate paralytic from a hero to a heel. In, in his twist of the biblical text, Jesus encounters a man by the pool of Bethesda, a man just lying around feeling sorry for himself. And in response to Jesus' simple, straightforward question, the paralytic begins listing all of his excuses. The paralytic says, I'm all alone. I don't have anyone to help me. Other people have let me down. I'm quoting Joel Osteen here. Other people have always gotten ahead of me. I don't have a chance in life. And then with, with not the least hint of mercy, Osteen continues, is it any wonder that he remained in that condition for 38 years? And then, and then, of course, contrast to the conduit to clarity. So he makes a contrast. And in sharp contrast, says Osteen, in sharp contrast to this paralytic, his own sister Lisa arose from the ashes of a painful divorce and remarried. And unlike that paralytic, she, she just wasn't going to sit around by the pool for 38 years feeling sorry for herself. <laughs> I, I, I mean, to disfigure a biblical passage in, in, in this in, in this extraordinary, extravagant way is almost beyond belief. And, and Osteen isn't finished. Positively or negatively, he says, creative words, creative words have power. In fact, creative power resides in your words. And then he uses scripture or misuses scripture one more time to make his point. 
This time, it's the story of Abraham and Sarah. Uh, This is what he says. The moment God told Sarah she was going to have a child, Sarah, who saw herself as an older, barren woman, began making negative confessions. Indeed, says Osteen, God had to change the image Abraham and Sarah had of themselves before they could ever have that child. So how did God do that? Well, he changed their names. He changed the words that they were hearing. He changed Sarai to Sarah. And Sarah means princess. And therefore, every time someone said, hello, Sarah, they were saying, hello, princess. And over time, that changed her self-image. Now she no longer sees herself as an older, barren woman. She begins to see herself as a princess. And as a direct result of that, writes Osteen, she gives birth to a child. So for Osteen, if you're catching the point, words are downright magical. They are the secret. In the physical realm, you have to see it to believe it. But, says Osteen, God says you have to believe it, and then you'll see it. Think about it, he says. Your words go go out of your mouth, and they come right back into your own ears. If you hear those comments long enough, they will drop down into your spirit, and those words will produce exactly what you're saying. And then as proof, (laughs) he pulls out the trump card. He does this every time. It is maddening, quite frankly. He invokes the Scripture. But not the truth of Scripture, but a false perception, a false reading of Scripture. He says, the Scripture tells us that we are to call the things that are not as if they already were. I've got to take a little uh, sip of water here because my throat's getting a little dry. (coughs) Excuse me. I must have been thinking a negative thought. So, at any rate, not only does Osteen rashly reason that God's purpose in changing Sarai to Sarah was to affect her self-image and alter her negative confessions, but he makes a morally reckless application to the present. He does so by telling the story of a friend named Joe whose wife had five miscarriages before He says, something clicked inside of him. He realized that his given name was Joseph, meaning God will add. Joe then required everyone to call him Joseph, believing that in doing so, they were speaking faith into his life. And as a result, God would add to him a son. So here's how Osteen puts it. Several months after Joseph began believing his name, his wife became pregnant again. And for the first time in 10 years, she carried the child to full term and gave birth to a healthy baby boy. The moral of the story, at least according to Osteen, is that with our words, we can prophesy our own future. Now, the implication here is is pretty hard to miss. If Joe had listened to God speaking to him some 10 years earlier, the lives of five children would have been saved, and he and his wife would have been spared a world of hurt. And not only that, but with millions of Osteen books in print, you can only imagine the numbers of people who must even now be superstitiously fretting over the spiritual implications of their names. Osteen's methods are, well, they're remarkably like those used by Rhonda Byrne. In pulpit and print, it communicates an endless string of undocumented anecdotes and urban legends. So Rhonda Byrne does it, Joel Osteen does it. And, and, And sometimes the stories seem downright silly. 
I'll give you an example of that. It, it, he, he's trying to buttress his belief in generational curses, and he chronicles an interesting study that was done in 1993 by the United States military. And he says they were curious about what traits get passed down from one generation to the next. So Osteen tells the story as follows. He says, the researchers extracted some white blood cells from a volunteer, and they carefully placed them in a test tube. They then put a probe from a lie detector machine down. I, I can't even believe I'm reading this, but it comes right from his book. It comes right from his sermons. It comes right from his own writings. So anyway, the researchers extract some white blood cells from a volunteer. They carefully place them in a test tube. Then they put a probe from a lie detector machine down in the test tube. They measure the person's emotional response. Then they instruct the volunteer to go a couple of doors down and watch some violent scenes from an old war movie on television. When this man watched the scenes, even though the blood that was being tested was in another room, when it got all up tight and tense, the lie detector test shot off the page. It was detecting his emotional response even though the blood was no longer in his body. Now, now by, by the way, according to Joel Osteen, this is a study done in 1993. He gives a specific date and a, a specific organization, the United States military. And then he adds that it is not an isolated experience. The United States experimenters did this with person after person. So the United States military is doing this in an ongoing fashion with one after another, and each person has the same results. And so they conclude that the blood cells seem to remember where they came from. <laughs> the, the, this tale is, is obviously bizarre on so many different levels, and yet Osteen employs it with a purpose. His purpose is to convince his devotees that the problems they encounter in the present can be pawned off to proclivities of parents and grandparents in the past. So, where Rhonda Byrne primarily abuses science to sanitize her stories. Joel Osteen principally abuses Scripture to sanitize his stories. And while his misinterpretations might be rationalized on the basis of limited theological acumen, his, his misquotations cannot be rationalized in that fashion. Because again and again, he alters the text of Scripture to conform to word faith proclivities. As I noted previously, to buttress the belief that words create reality, Osteen says the scripture tells us that we are to call the things that are not as if they already were. But as he most surely knows, Scripture says nothing of the sort. In fact, the very passage that Osteen is referencing, it's Romans 4.17, that very passage clearly communicates that it is the God who gives life, not we, who calls things that are not as though they were. So if occult sources such as those referenced in the secret pose the greatest threat to the body of Christ from without, the deadly doctrines that are being disseminated by those prosperity preachers like Joel Osteen, they pose the greatest threat to Christianity from within. And that's why you and I need to use our critical thinking faculties. Moreover, we need to test all things in light of Scripture and then hold fast to that which is good. We need not to look for fast feud formulas, for secrets. We need to live the Christian life with purpose and with discipline. Because otherwise we're always going to fall for one ruse after the other. 
whether it's a ruse that comes from the culture via the secret by Ron de Verne, or a ruse provide in a Christian context by someone like Joel Osteen. And remember that there are so many people that will argue, and they certainly have done this with me personally, look at all of the people that are listening to his message. How can he possibly be wrong? And what most of those people don't realize is that there are a lot of people coming into the front doors of his mega conventions or his church extravaganzas. But there are a lot of people in the, in the process falling out the back doors of those events. So it looks like you got the same crowd, as it were. New people coming in, the front door, and people that have been there for a while falling out the back door. And the tragedy is they don't know what to believe anymore. They've been deceived. They know they've been deceived. They've lost their livelihoods. In some cases, they have taken a shortcut, compromised their health. And they think, if this is wrong, then Christianity is wrong. But this is not Christianity. The secret is not some formula given by people like Oprah or Rhonda Byrne or Joel Osteen or Kenneth Copeland or you name it. The secret is not what they are feeding you. Any more than the secret to nutrition is found in a McDonald's hamburger, quite frankly. The secret is to live a consistent life. The secret is discipline. The discipline of reading Scripture. The discipline of prayer. The discipline of the liturgical calendar where, where you reinforce week after week the principles of the kingdom. The secret is not found in 21st century innovations. The secret is going back to when the church was young. To follow the example of Jesus as he taught his disciples, and the disciples as they taught the apostolic fathers. And the apostolic fathers, as they were followed by the great apologists of the church. And then the pre- and post-Nicene fathers. The secret, if I can use that term, is in living a consistent, disciplined life. It's hard work. And in the process you will face tragedy. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Joel Osteen wants you to believe that you can have your best life now by following his formulas. But you can't. Some of the greatest the greatest saints died poor. They weren't healthy and wealthy. They died in tragic circumstances. But they were looking to a far greater reward, an eternal reward. If you want to read about it, read about it in, in Hebrews chapter 11, that great faith hall of fame chapter in the Bible where you see Christians being persecuted, stripped bare of their belongings, even their clothes being beaten and ultimately martyred. 
And then in the very next chapter, St. Paul points us to these same people as now a great cloud of witnesses who are urging us to run the race, to fight the good fight. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, looking unto Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's our example. The saints did not live for the temporary. They lived for the eternal. They recognized that this life is but a drop in the ocean of eternity. So they set their sights on things above rather than on things below, on eternal verities as opposed to the temporary earthly things that never seem to fully satisfy. So if you're looking to the secret, remember you're not going to find it in popular books by Rhonda Byrne, promoted by Oprah Winfrey, in popular television broadcasts and venues, extravaganzas led by people like Joel Osteen. You're going to find it in going back to the basics. So I started out saying at the beginning of this podcast, I found out over years and years of playing the game of golf that you have to put in the work. Every shortcut ultimately fails you. But if you get the Word of God into you as you get into the Word of God, as you develop intimacy with the lover of your soul through prayer, then you will find something that is not temporary, not a quick fix, but an eternal resolution. Thanks for tuning in to this edition of the Hank Unplugged podcast. Look forward to seeing you next time with more of the podcast. So long for now.